Take your Bibles with me today and turn to John 21 or take your device and turn it on. However you open your Bible, I would encourage you to do so. After 30 years of ministry, there are many things that still amaze me. Actually, I've been in ministry, I think, 32 years. There's many things that amaze me, but one of the things that amazes me more than, not more than anything else, but as far as ministry goes, is the fact that it's not pastors, but faithful lay members, faithful church members that do the majority of God's work. Sometimes I think we have this false impression that the majority of God's work is is done by pastors, but that very simply is not the case. The majority of God's work is done by volunteers. The majority of God's work is done by people like you and people like me. Week after week, there are scores of volunteers that make ministry happen here at Hollywood Community Church. Last Saturday night, more than 15 people were here late unpacking boxes of food as we received uh, last week more than 30,000 pounds of food from the post office. And by the way, this week we received another 30,000 pounds. On Monday night, Matt and Betty Sinelli, two of our deacons, were at the hospital ministering to a family that just heard that they have to put their loved one on life support. On Tuesday night, Al Conrad and his team were leading our our Celebrate Recovery ministry. All week long, we've had scores of volunteers that are in our open heart food pantry that are sorting and shelving thousands of pounds of food. Every day, Mary and Bonnie and Maria and Pat, our ladies that work in our receptionist desk, don't get paid anything They just work there on a weekly basis. Phil Dykhouse volunteers more than 30 hours every single week in our facilities ministry. Right now, there are more than 20 volunteers, probably 30 volunteers that are in the children's ministry ministering to your kids while we are in church. Joel and his team are on the soundboard today. Bill Wallace was here early this morning, maybe about the time that you were waking up, getting the parking lot ready, everything ready to receive you on Sunday morning. I can't fail to mention our First Impressions team, our men's ministry team, our women's ministry team, and I could go on and on. If I didn't mention your team, it's not because you're not important. Every single one of our volunteers are important. You see, the truth is this, that Hollywood Community Church could not function without hundreds of volunteers that make ministry happen. And today, we thank you, and we commend you, and we celebrate those of you that are actively involved in ministry. And yet, as thrilled as I am for those that are involved in ministry, I realize that there are as many that are not involved in ministry. George Barna recently uh, reported this statistic. He reported that 57% of church attenders in the United States have not volunteered in their church in the last year. That's 57%. More than half of the people that attend the average church are not actively involved in ministry. George Barna went on to report that 28% of regular church attenders have never volunteered. They've never been involved in ministry. Church, the simple truth is this, that you and I have been saved, not just to enjoy the benefits of salvation, You and I have been saved, not just so that we can say, amen, I'm going to heaven one day. But every single one of us have been saved by the grace of God. We've received the Holy Spirit of God. We've been gifted for the purpose of serving. My goal this morning is to challenge each of you to step up to the plate and be involved in the work of God, whether it's here at Hollywood Community Church, whether it is on the mission field, whether it's in your neighborhood, we have been called to serve. 
We're in the middle of a series that we're simply calling connection uh, or, or connect the dots. And the idea is this, that, that for some reason we're conscious, we're cognizant of the fact that there's, there's people in our church and churches all around that for some reason that dot hasn't been connected. They, they, they have failed to realize that they were saved for a purpose. And this morning we want to connect those dots We want you to realize that God has gifted you. God has empowered you. God has given you all the tools necessary so that you can be involved in one way or another in the work of God. We see that in the passage that we're looking at today, John chapter 21. Before we begin walking through the passage, let me give you just a little bit of background information as to what's taking place in this chapter. The events of John chapter 21 take place some 10 to 15 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Recently, we studied Jesus' resurrection, and so the events that John writes about here in John chapter 21 take place a week and a half to two weeks after Jesus rose from the dead. We'll see in just a moment that that Jesus once again appears to Peter and John and five of the other disciples. Many believe that this appearance of Jesus was the seventh post-resurrection appearance. And so uh, we find Jesus at a place in between his resurrection and in between his ascension. If If you're familiar with the New Testament, you realize that Jesus shortly will ascend up into heaven Well, the events of John chapter 21 take place before he does that. This chapter is often listed as the epilogue to John's gospel. It's listed as the epilogue because it it almost comes after the conclusion. If you go back to the very last verses of John chapter 20, I'm not going to put them up on the screen. You can look at them in your device or your Bible. It says, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, You may have life by the power of his name. It seems as if John ends the book. He says, this is why I wrote the book. I wrote the book so that you might believe. And as you believe, that you might have power in the name of Jesus. We could have put an amen right there and the book ended. But there was one more story that John wanted to tell. Uh, an epilogue. There was one more event that John thought was worthy of our consideration. One more thing that happened specifically in the life of Peter that is applicable not only to Peter's life, but to your life and to mine. And so we'll look at that this morning. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Lord, as we look in your word, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would help us to see not only what you were teaching Peter, but in the short time that we have, I pray that you'd help us to realize what you're teaching us as well. And just as you exhorted and motivated and challenged Peter to get back in to your work, I pray that you would motivate and challenge and encourage us to be involved in the work of God as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Notice with me John chapter 21 and verse 1. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the sea of Galilee. Let me pause there for a second. If you recall in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 7, an angel had promised the disciples that Jesus would meet them in Galilee. So after spending a few days post-resurrection there in Jerusalem, it seems like many of the disciples went back to their hometowns, went back to the region around the Sea of Galilee. They made their way home, waiting for Jesus to show up. Verse 2, this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. We see in total there were, there were seven disciples present. He names five of them. We're not sure who the two unnamed guys are. Verse 3, Simon Peter said this, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all 
nights. Peter declared that he was going fishing. Now, I'm going to be honest, there's some debate as to what Peter meant by that phrase. Most Bible teachers hold that Peter wasn't just saying, I'm going on a one-day fishing trip, but rather that Peter was saying, you know what, I'm going fishing. I'm, I'm retiring from this gig as an apostle of Jesus Christ. You'll remember that Peter's life was one of ups and downs. Shortly before Jesus' death, Peter boasted that he would never leave Jesus, that he would never abandon Jesus. Remember the story? Peter said, hey, Lord, some of those other guys might abandon you, but not me. I want you to know, Lord, that I'm willing to stand up for you. I'm not going to leave you. Why, hey, I'm willing to take a bullet for you. They didn't have bullets then, but I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to give my life for you. You know the story, though, but when push came to shove, when Peter was given the opportunity to stand up for Jesus, how did Peter respond? He failed miserably. You know the story. Three times he denied the Lord. And now as Peter returned to the Sea of Galilee, he must have thought, and admittedly I'm reading into the passage, but Peter must have thought, I'm just not cut out for this disciple thing. Serving Jesus is really hard. Serving Jesus is too hard. Better for me to do what I do best. I'm going back to being a fisherman. I'm much better at catching fish than I am at catching men. Peter says this, I'm going fishing. Let me pause for a second and make an application. I wrote this in my outline and it's in your notes. The first thought that I thought of as I read through this is this. Christian service is often neglected because of life's challenges. You see, Peter was faced with a challenge and Peter knew that he blew it. He was given an opportunity and he blew it. He realized that. As a result, Peter was discouraged as a result of his past failure. Let me say this today. I believe that there are many Christians like Peter that are discouraged because of past failures. Maybe in the past you were involved in some type of Christian service. Maybe you worked in children's ministry. Maybe you sang on a worship team. Maybe you took a missions trip. Maybe you took meals to grieving families. But in one way or another, you were actively involved in service, in Christian service. But then something happened. Either you failed or someone failed you. Either You were offended, or you offended someone else. And as a result, you're no longer involved in serving the Lord. Yeah, you come to church, but your time of serving, your time of volunteering is past. Many believe that's what was taking place in Peter's life. Many Christians today, like Peter, are not involved in Christian service because of past failures. As we walk through the Bible, there's a lot of illustrations that we can give. Maybe like Moses, you're held back because of a feeling of inadequacy. Maybe you'd like to serve, but you just don't feel capable of serving. Remember when when God came to Moses there in the burning bush and he called Moses and wanted Moses to to do the job. And later on there in Exodus chapter 4, Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Moses is saying, hey God, look for somebody else. I'm not capable of doing what you're asking me to do. Maybe you feel that way today. Maybe you feel like there is nothing that you can offer. Maybe you're shy. Maybe you're musically challenged. Maybe you're physically uncoordinated. Or you just say, Brian, I'm generally ungifted. There is nothing that I can offer the Lord. Oh, my brother, my sister, you are so wrong today. Let me challenge you with the thought that you are of extreme value to God. 
And God has already given you some talent, some ability that you can use in His service. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10 says this, God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gift. Use them well to serve one another. You see, all of us here today that name the name of Jesus Christ, all of us that are followers of Jesus have received some spiritual gift from him and that gift was given to us for the purpose of using in his work. You are capable. You are God-gifted. You are God-empowered. God desires to use you. Others may be like Demas, are Christians that are distracted by life's diversions. If you're familiar with Demas, who was Paul's companion, Paul said this, Demas has deserted me because he has loved the things of this life and gone back to Thessalonica. If you know the story, Demas stopped serving the Lord because the distractions of the world were too great for him would venture to say that there are many believers like that today. I venture to say there's people here like that today. You want to serve the Lord, but life is too busy. There are just way too many things to do. There's work, and there's baseball for the kids, and there's family get-togethers, and of course there's Miami Dolphin games, and there's weekend getaways. There are just not enough days in the week, life distracts us from serving the Lord. So can I ask you a real personal question today? You don't have to answer. But are you involved in some type of Christian service? Are you serving the Lord? If you're not, why not this morning? Don't allow life's challenges to keep you from becoming and doing who God wants you to be and what God wants you to do. You see, Christian service is often neglected because of life's challenges. The second thing that we see as we dig back into the passage is this, that Christian service is often revived by a fresh glimpse of, of Jesus. Would you continue reading with me? So, so here's Peter and the disciples. They said they've gone fishing. They fished all night long and caught nothing. Verse 4 says this, at dawn Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He calls out to them, fellas, hey guys, have you caught any fish? No. They replied. Now, now, the first thing we see in the passage is this, that the disciples, Peter and the disciples, did not recognize that it was Jesus on the shore. As Jesus calls out to them and begins to converse with them, the disciples aren't conscious, they're not cognizant of who it is that is speaking to them. They hear someone calling out, but they're not sure who it is. Now, why would they not have recognized Jesus? There's several thoughts. Maybe the early morning fog kept them from recognizing him. Maybe Jesus disguised his appearance. Remember on the road to Emmaus, the people were talking to Jesus and they didn't know who he was? Or, or some even conclude that maybe Jesus' post-resurrection appearance was, was different than his pre-resurrection appearance. We don't know why they didn't recognize him, but either way, here is Jesus on the shore yelling out to them, and they have no idea who is speaking to them. They have no idea who he was. And as I read through that, I wrote down another question. Let me ask you this morning. How often is Jesus speaking to you? How often is Jesus at work in your life and you fail to recognize him? Jesus on the shore of your life, as it were, crying out to you, hey, fellas, hey, Brian, what are you doing? Have you caught any fish? And because of the busyness, because of the fog of my life, I'm, a, I'm unable to realize that it's Jesus that's talking to me. That's what's taking place 
in the passage. Notice verse 6. Then Jesus said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. Throw out your net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch some fish. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord, John cries out. It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to the shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore, for they were about 100 yards from shore. All right, so here's what's taking place. Put your... your, yourself in the disciples shoes you've been fishing all night long we have any fishermen in the congregation you've been fishing all night long and you haven't caught anything you're tired you're frustrated and you're ready to quit all of a sudden somebody yells from the shore and you have no idea who it is starts giving you instructions hey if you do this you'll catch some fish If you'll bait that hook differently, you'll catch something. If you'll fish on the other side of the boat, you'll catch something. You don't know who it is. What's your response going to be? All right, if I'm tired, frustrated, fished all night with no, I want to look at that guy and say, would you shut up? You have no idea what you're saying. But for some reason, that's not how the disciples respond. Whether there was authority in Jesus' voice, they still didn't know who he was. Jesus said, put your nets to the other side of the boat, and the text says that they obeyed Jesus. They instantly did what Jesus told them to do. And the text says this, immediately the net was filled with fish. The catch of fish was instantaneous. At that point, something clicks in John's mind, and John cries out, It's the Lord! It's Jesus. Now, why would that have clicked in John's mind? If you remember the New Testament, this, almost this exact same miracle had happened to the disciples previously. And when they saw Jesus work in their lives the same way that he'd worked it in their life before, they realized why it's none other than Jesus. And so it was only when Peter and the disciples caught a boatload of fish that they recognized Jesus. Now I sat back and as I read through a passage, I always ask questions. And and I began to question, why did Jesus do this miracle? Why didn't he just identify himself? Why didn't Jesus just say, hey guys, it's me, Jesus. Why, Why did he use the miracle to identify himself. I gave you a couple of reasons in your notes. The first I just said, Jesus performed this miracle to identify himself to his disciples. When they realized, man, could you imagine hadn't fished all night long, you put the net on the other side, and instantly the net is filled with a boatload of fish. Those disciples realized something miraculous just happened. This isn't an ordinary guy. This is Jesus. The second thing I wrote is this, Jesus performed this miracle to remind the disciples that he was still all-powerful. They had seen Jesus do miracles before his death. Was he the same Jesus after his death? Would this post-resurrection Jesus be able to do the exact same things that pre-resurrection Jesus did? And he demonstrated to them that he was still the all-powerful one. But the third thing I wrote down is this. Jesus performed this miracle to renew the disciples' desire, to renew their passion, to see God do amazing things. When all of a sudden that net was filled, it was like those emotions stirred up in their hearts again. John, why it's Jesus and Peter, so excited, jumps out of the boat as a fisherman. He'd stripped down to his skivvies. And so here's Peter. He jumps down to his boat. He grabs the tunic, throws the tunic around, and he can't get to the shore fast enough. Why? Because it's not a stranger on the shore. Who's on the shore? It's Jesus that's on the shore. Jesus did this miracle so that the disciples' passion would be renewed to see God do amazing things in their life. So I read that, I asked myself this question, when was the last time that God did a miracle in my life? 
When was the last time that I was, that I was cognizant, that I was aware, that I realized that it is God at work in my life? Let me challenge you with the thought that God is at work in your life and God desires to do miracles in your life and mine on a regular basis. Small as they may be, they are still miracles. And we fail to realize that God is at work. Yesterday in our Saturday morning service, we had a lady that stood up. First time I'd ever seen her, and she wanted to give testimony. She said, two weeks ago, I stood here, and I prayed with somebody out in the food pantry, praying that God would enable a way that my child could go into aftercare at the school they go to. She said, Pastor Brian, that was on Saturday. On Monday, I get a phone call from somebody saying that it is completely paid. My child can stay in aftercare. She said, Pastor Brian, that was a miracle that God did in my life. She realized it. What was the last miracle that God did in your life? You see, just as God was at work in the lives of the disciples, God is at work in your life and mine as well. Continue reading with me in verse 9. When they got to the shore, when they got to the shore, they found breakfast waiting for them. Food or fish was cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some fish that you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. I love this. There were 153 large fish. Don't you love the fact that they counted them? Not the fact that they counted them, but they had to tell us how many they caught. How many? It wasn't about 150. There was 150. There were 153 of them. They knew exactly how many they were. Jesus says, now come and have some breakfast. Jesus said, none, or, or Jesus said, then none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. I don't know how you read that phrase, they knew it was the Lord, but I read it with a sense of excitement. After Jesus' death, no doubt there had been some apprehension. There had been some uncertainty as to their calling, as to their ministry, as to their future. What would happen? Jesus wasn't with them every day. What would ministry look like? What would life look like? But now as they sat around the fire, their calling was revived. Their ministry was renewed. And the excitement began to build. I love how it says, None of them dared say anything, but they all knew that it was Jesus. Do you sense a giddiness on the part of the disciples? I mean, they're there. They've wanted to spend time with the Lord, but he's been absent. And all of a sudden, they're eating breakfast on the Sea of Galilee with none other than whom? None other than Jesus. And they were so excited about it, nobody said anything, but there was a giddiness, there was an excitement, there was an emotion that they were with Jesus. And spending time with Jesus renewed these disciples' passion. I read that and think, wow, what an application for us. Generally speaking, a lack of vision, a lack of excitement, an unwillingness to be involved in the work of God comes from not spending enough time time with Jesus. Did you catch that, catch that today? A lack of willingness, a lack of vision, a lack of excitement to be involved in the work of God comes from not spending enough time with Jesus. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more inflamed our hearts will be to serve him. There's a third thing that we see in the passage and this is my favorite part of the story. But the third thing is this. Christian service is best motivated by love. Breakfast is over. Lounging around the fire. You know what it's like to lounge around the fire? Lounging around the fire, just talking. Verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, or son of John, do you love me more than these? No doubt... Peter's, Peter must have thought, what kind of question is that, Lord? Why, you know that I love you. There's some ambiguity as to what Jesus meant by, do you love me more than these? Did Jesus, when he said that, did he look at the other six disciples that were there, you know, Peter's buddies, the guys that he lived with for three and a half years, and was Jesus saying, hey, Peter, do you love me more than these guys? 
over here? Or when Jesus made that statement, did he look over at the fishing tackle, the boat, and the nets, and, and, and the profession that Peter loved? And he said, Peter, do you love me more than your fishing equipment? Do you love me more than your boat, Peter? Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. They sat there for a few minutes more. And once again, Jesus, hey, hey, Pete, do you love me? Pete, do you, do you love me, Peter? Lord, Peter says, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Peter. A few moments later, after a few minutes of silence, hey, Peter, one more question. What, Lord? Peter, do you love me more than these? Lord, Peter says, you know that I love you. You know that you're important to me. And Jesus says, Peter, feed my sheep. Why did God ask him the question? Why did Jesus ask him the question one time? Was Jesus unsure of the answer? What was the reason that, Peter, that, that Jesus kept pressing Peter? I believe there were several lessons that Jesus wanted Peter to learn, several lessons that are applicable to us as well. Catch this, it's in your notes. Here's what Jesus wanted Peter to get. No matter what you have done, forgiveness is available for you. Peter, it doesn't matter that you denied me. Not once, not twice, not three times. Peter, I love you. And Peter, I forgive you. And Peter, you still are of service to me. Here's what Jesus was saying, Peter. Peter, you're not washed up. Peter, you're not useless to me. I still have a job for you to do. Peter, feed my sheep. Oh my, what a relief that must have been for Peter to hear what Jesus said. Although Peter failed, Peter was not a failure. Although Peter had blown it, he had not blown all of his chances. Jesus still wanted to use him. And if you read the book of Acts, use him. Jesus did. That same message goes for each and every one of us this morning. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you've blown it. Maybe you're here today and you say, Brian, you have no idea what I've done. You have no idea how I've strayed from God. You have no idea this morning, Brian, how I've abandoned God. I get it. You blew it. You failed God. And now this morning you fear that God has put you on a shelf as if he doesn't want to use you anymore. Listen to me today. Nothing could be farther from the truth. No matter what you have done, forgiveness is available. And just as God used Peter again, God desires to use you. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 103 too, he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Here's the second thing. i got to be done, but let me give you two more. The second is this. No matter what you do, love must be your motivation. Peter, do you love me? Then serve me. Do you love me, Peter? Then serve me. Do you love me, Peter? Serve me. You see, this morning, our greatest motivation for service is not the fact that there is a need. Oh, my word, I, I watched those pictures of Haiti again. And my heart is broken by the need that exists there. But the greatest reason for me to be involved in Haiti and for you to be involved in Haiti and for us to be involved in the food pantry and other ministries is not because there is a need. The greatest motivation is not that the church or the pastor needs your help. The greatest motivation for service is your love for Jesus. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? 
If you love me then, serve my sheep. Peter, get involved in ministry. Do something. Show that you love me by serving others. Church, this morning, do you love Jesus? We demonstrate that love not just by singing, oh, how I love Jesus. We demonstrate that love by serving his sheep. And as we love the unlovely, and as we reach out to the needy, and as we try to mend the broken hearts of the brokenhearted, we demonstrate not only our love for them, but we demonstrate our love for Jesus. Just as Jesus asked Peter, do you love me, Peter, then serve others? God's asking you this morning, do you love me? If you love me, serve others, then serve me. Let me show you, notice two other verses, verses 18 and 19, I'm done. Jesus tells Peter, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked, you dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go, but when you were old, you were stretch out your hands, others will dress you and take where you want, where you don't want to go. Notice verse 19, Jesus said this, to let him know what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow Jesus says, hey, Pete, by the way, you're going to die a violent death. If you know anything about church history, Peter was crucified like Jesus. And when Peter went to be crucified, tradition states that Peter said, I don't deserve to be crucified like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. And tradition states that Peter was crucified upside down. Here Jesus says, Peter, you need to know the future is not going to be easy for you. You're going to have some struggles. You're going to die a violent death. But notice the last thing he says, but follow me. Follow me. Here's the idea. It doesn't matter what's going to happen in your future or mine. It doesn't matter what's going to happen in Peter's future Serving and following Jesus must be our goal. Peter, forget about what's going to happen in the future. Serve me. Follow me. Peter, feed my sheep. Church, we have such an opportunity to make an impact on our community. I'm so excited about some of the things we're going to be telling you. We're, we're about to adopt a neighborhood very close to here. We're going to go in that neighborhood, and we're going to transform that neighborhood for Jesus Christ. We need volunteers that are going to help us to do that. We need to send a team to Karai, Haiti every single year. That city has such a need, and, 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 and I don't know of anybody else, Dan might, I don't know of anybody else that's, that's reaching out to that city. God's placed that opportunity in our laps. We need you to help us. We have, we have two ladies right now in Hope House, Stephanie and Cynthia. They need people to love them to Jesus Christ. We're feeding 70 to 100 families every week in our food pantry. We need people that are going to come alongside of us and help us. We need you to be Jesus in your neighborhood. Church, here's the thing. You're called to serve. The reason, one of the main reasons, other than honoring himself, God saved us, obviously, so that he would be honored and glorified through our life, but he saved us and he capacitated us for the purpose of serving him. You're called to serve. What would happen if every member of HCC stood up and said, Brian Burkholder reporting for duty, Vicki Burkholder reporting for duty, God, here I am. Help me to love and serve others. Peter, do you love me? If you love me, feed my sheep. Mm -hmm.